All right, so welcome back. Um, this example, this will be our first design example for the bending of um, compact shapes, okay, our lateral, lateral torsional buckling um, calculation. So um, just real quick, what we're being asked to find is we're being asked to find the lightest W shape of A36 steel that satisfies this problem. We have a simply supported beam, distributed load, okay, with um, a, a point load P located at the middle. Now, for this particular problem, our service load is 36 kips. It's 40% dead, 60% live. And our uh, service distributed load is one, you know, 1 KLF, 15% dead, 85% live. All right, and the, the statistics on this beam, this is what you gotta watch out for, right? On every problem that you come across, you have to ask yourself, where are my bracing points? All right, and so what we're doing is we're looking, gonna brace this thing you know, by maybe it's a lateral member or something. We're gonna brace it at the quarter points. So I'm gonna brace it at the ends and then at, and at seven and a half feet and then at 15 feet, 22 and a half, so forth. So the whole span length is uh, 30 feet long, okay? Now, first thing we do is we factor the loads. So very quickly, you can see that the factor load for WU is uh, 1.54. We're using the 1.2 dead case and the 1.6 live, okay? And then for PU, the factor load is 51.8. Um, kips as well, okay, and if I do that, then I can go in and I can compute the maximum moment. Now, all I'm doing is a simple superposition of the moments because if I look at the point load, the maximum moment is directly under the point load, and if I look at a distributed load, the maximum for a simply supported span is located at the middle. It happens to be the same location of those two points, so I can do superposition in these guys. Um, if this point load were off center, we would have to be a little bit more careful on our calculations, but again, I just want to get into how do we determine the, um, the actual uh, appropriate size? All right, so that's all I'm doing here is I'm taking the, the, the maximum moment from the point load and I'm adding it to the maximum uh, moment from the distributed load because they are at the same location, which happens to be the mid-span. All right, and so that's 562 kip feet. And I'll write at mid-span. All right, and that will be on the notes. Okay, all right, so now to solve this, all we're gonna do is we're going to calculate then um, figure out you know that the capacity the, the design capacity has to be greater than the applied load and so I'm going to rearrange a little bit and solve for the actual required nominal capacity which is uh, 562 kip feet and then feet for bending of course is 0.9 and so that will be 625 kip feet. All right now here's where we have to start to kind of make some assumptions and as we talked about last time okay this was that general curve that we had for nominal moment versus unbraced length for a uh, lateral torsional buckling problem, all right? And so we said that we knew that in region one, it was constant at an MP value, and then it started to drop off linearly, and then it got really weak out here in that, that third zone. But we mentioned that this point here was kind of a sweet spot for us. And the reason is, is, is that this is the most efficient use of the material that we have. Now we know that the, the, the LB is seven and a half feet, okay? And I know the equation for LP is 1.76 RY, radius of gyration with respect to y um, times the square root of e over fy. Okay, so for fy of 36 ksi and e of 29,000 ksi, our LP is approximately 50 ry. All right, because we want to have a little bit of lateral stiffness in order to make sure that I'm maintaining myself up in this region here. Okay, and so that's why we're going to make the assumption that LB is approximately the same value as LP. Okay, like I say, that's kind of kind of walk this thing through. All right, now, Here's a, an interesting rule of thumb that, you know, based on experience and as well as some other references for I-beams, um, our RY is often in the range of about 20% of BF, okay? So since we, we're going to have two design parameters that show up in this thing, I'm going to have the ZX value that will show up when I do MP here, okay? But at the same time, I need something to make sure that my, my, my LP value, this guy, is also okay. All right, so if I use this rule of thumb, okay, like I say, this is not in, in our in our uh, McCormick textbook. Okay, this actually came out of one of the references that's listed in the syllabus. This is the Salmon and Johnson textbook. Um, and if I do, if I make this assumption and I'm willing to live with it, they have a whole a whole set of others for different shapes like channels and angles and that kind of stuff. They do something similar on this, but it basically relates this the radius of gyration to some parameter. In this case, it's going to be BF. All right, and so if I calculate LP using this equation, then it's 50 times 0.22 times BF, okay? And so what I can do is I can then take this LP here and I can compare it back to the LP that's here. And I can work my way into a minimum BF dimension, okay? This is the flange width that we have, all right? And if I do that and I go through and make sure you watch your units and I end up with 8.2 inches, okay? That's our first design parameter, 
right now. Moving on to the next page. Okay. All right. As we start to kind of work on this, okay, so if we assume zone one, then LB has to be less than LP, okay, which means then that the nominal moment is equal to the plastic moment, which is equal to ZXFY. Okay, again, this is an assumption. So we're going to assume it for now, and then we're going to verify it at the very, very end when we get, get to it, all right? So just like we did with the lambda problems in zone one, we're going to solve for our ZX required. Okay, that's just MN over FY. Okay, and so this becomes 625 um, kip feet. Uh, convert the units, divide by 36 KSI, and so our minimum uh, ZX that we can accept is 208 inches cubed, all right? And so for us, um, our design parameters now become the following, ZX min uh, 208 inches cu um, cubed and BF min 8.2, all right? All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump into that table 3.2 again. Those are the ZX tables. Now, if you remember from the last video, this is the table um, I'm actually a, a few pages back, and we'll, we'll show you um, why that is here, okay? But I'm gonna make sure that I'm at 50 KSI. We're looking for ZX. Now remember, this table has a whole lot of data values in it that are really useful for 50 KSI. But the problem is, is our particular example is only 36. So this table technically doesn't work for us, okay? But what does work for us that's independent of the FY is this, this one column ZX, all right? So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read up and I'm gonna find the appropriate uh, particular shape um, on us. So if I slide up a little bit, you can see that, you know, I'm coming up and we're going to see that uh, we have a bunch of shapes of, you know, what 196, um, here's 200, and then 211. Now remember, all of these loads in this table are grouped together such that they're ranked in order of ZX values, okay, but, but then they're clustered into groups. So if I look at this group that's, you know, say this one right here, okay, the bottom one is an 18 by 97, and the top one is a W24 by 84, you'll notice that they're all increasing Zs in the group, okay? But then what they've done is, is they've basically found the lightest of the shapes, okay? And the lightest of this particular grouping is this guy up here, which is a 24 by 84. Okay, now it turns out he ends up being our answer, okay? But I'm gonna show you a couple of things along the way on how we can kind of conclude some of the data that we can do, all right? So, but that's what we're gonna look at, okay? So again, LP and LR over here don't matter, but for us, that's gonna make a difference for us. Okay, all right, let me put this away and we will continue on. Okay, all right, so if I go through and I do that, okay, and all I've done is I basically read through that table and I've picked off the values. And now since I don't have any restrictions on depth, there wasn't any deflection limits listed, or anything, I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna find all of them just as a case of the exercise, all right? So all of the shapes that matter, um, that, that meet the criteria of having a ZX over 208 and, which was our values here, and a BF minimum that's greater than 8.2 are listed, okay? These are the lightest guys from each of the major depth categories. All right, so I have a W12 by 136, a 14 by 120. Um, there actually isn't a 16 because the largest W16 shape is only a 16 by 100. Okay, so these guys aren't usually your best choices for beams unless you're very lightly loaded. Okay, um, often in practice we'll go, we'll, instead of using a 16, we'll step up to an 18 and pull him instead, generally because you get better dimensions and better uh, properties out of it that way. Um, some, some other reasons. Um, 16s are often, more often used as columns, okay, than they are for beams. Uh, but but that's fine. Okay, so if I look, and so you can see I've got an 18 by 97, a 21 by 93, a 24 by 84, okay, and that was that one I pointed to on that table that we showed you just a second ago. And you can see all the ZX values meet the limits, and then all of my BF values also meet the limits, okay? Now, what you will notice is that in that group that was just one step higher, okay, there's a W27 by 84 also. So technically, these two guys' weights are the same. Okay, um, then you can see that if I go to the next one, 30 by 90, now all of a sudden the weights start coming up. And if I went to some of the larger sizes, their minimums are much larger than this anyway. So basically, I'm down to one of these two guys uh, being my controlling factor. Okay, now, if I had a deflection concern, I would instantly take the larger of the two. Okay, but if I have a spacing concern or I don't know, often I choose the shallowest shape. All right, because what this does is for a multi-story building, it basically saves me three inches of depth. Now, for one or two buildings, you know, um, you know, you know uh, one or two stories in a building, we're talking, you know, six inches of overall height. It's not a big deal. But if this building is 80 stories tall, 
Now all of a sudden I'm saving 240 inches. I just saved 20 feet of building height and all the parts that go with it. That means, you know, 20 foot less per column. You know, I'm, you know, 20 foot less of sheet, you know, sheetrock or, you know, stud length or something. I mean, it adds up when the buildings get really, really tall. Okay, so generally the rule of practice is that we want to choose the shallower shape unless there's some other reason that forces me into something deeper. All right, so that's why we're going to choose this guy. All right, so all we have to do now then is we check our assumptions. Okay, and we look at um, our W24 by 84. He has an ROI of 1.95, a BF of 9. Okay, and so I can calculate LP, which the LP ends up being 8.1 feet, which is greater than our 7.5, so we're okay. We're good. Okay, and so our lightest shape on this coming out of that table then is um, going to be a 24 by 84. And just kind of as a basis of comparison, if it's 30 feet long of A36, um, you know, if we assume $1.50 a pound, which kind of is a, a fairly in the ballpark estimate of, of pricing. I know uh, some of the research we did this semester showed it was actually a little bit lighter, uh, a little bit lower. Some of you guys were finding values, you know, around a dollar a pound or something. That's fine. Um, the cost of this beam alone is about uh, $3,700. Okay. Now, this doesn't include placement. It doesn't include, you know, erection or fabrication or anything. It's just the raw cost of the stock itself. All right. Now, if we look at it, you'll notice that we ended up uh, up in region one. That's what this particular calculation showed me. So our assumption about up here that we had MN equals MP was, was valid. Okay, now if we were to remove one of the braces on this picture, okay, and we won't work this all the way through, but just kind of talk conceptually about this. Okay, say instead I brace this thing, you know, at the ends and the middle and the end. Okay, but this guy at the quarter point, you know, at seven and a half feet and the one out here at 22 and a half, say those weren't braced there. All of a sudden what happens is now my unbraced length becomes 15 feet and it won't fit um, that criteria. We would fail that check for the LP and we'd actually be out in region two. Okay, and that's a big issue because now we get into that iteration formula and the CB value starts to play a role. So we would have to come in and calculate CB. Okay, and CB for this is probably around 1.8, 1.9 um, on here. Our triangle is 1.67 and this is a little bit more uniform than that. So we're, we're pushing 1.9, 2.0 somewhere if I had to, to wager a guess. This is an unusual diagram. This isn't one that's tallied for us. All right, so then that forces us into now not only do we need to know LP, but we also need to know LR. All right, because if we come and look at our calculation here, we would have to pick up the guy, the LR that's here. Okay, and that means I'm now iterating on this and trying to come up with a moment that's greater than the one that I need. And these sections, these sizes will get really, really big, really, really fast. Okay, um, and so that's kind of one of the things about bracing. Okay, now you'll notice in practice, one little thought that we can mention in practice is, is that, you know, kind of as a rule of thumb for framing, often beams in, in systems are placed at four foot on center. And they do this in order to be able to help with the decking for the concrete slab and those kind of things. But the other added advantage of sticking to a four foot or a five foot spacing on there is, is that now I'm almost always guaranteed to be in region one, okay, and which is a good deal. Okay, so that's another reason that it's often nice to stick with those normal spacings. Okay, now that isn't always possible, but it is a, a, a good reason. Okay, now, this was for 36 KSI. Okay, if it's 50 KSI, there are some other methods that we'll show you, and I'll show you those in the next video in which we go in and I can, um, I'll show you some of the charts and there's some shortcut methods that make 50 KSI problems absolutely trivial. Okay, and so we'll work, I'll show you, I'll show you that and then we'll work an example and we'll do a CV calculation and we'll be good to go. So anyway, um, that'll, we'll wrap that one up. I'll get this one up and that should get you in a good shape to be able to start kind of working with the with the homework. So anyway, uh, thanks for listening. We will talk to you all later. Bye-bye.